to see everybody today. Is it good to be in the house of the Lord on a Sunday morning? Yes, sir. Amen. Is it good to have the Lord build his house in you every other day of the week? <laughs> Amen. Let's all stand in honor of our good, good father, and we will start by talking to him. Whoa. Father, we, we want to thank you from the bottom of our hearts uh, just that you woke us up today, that we woke up alive. Um, for me personally, that I woke up another day sober. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And just, and for our families, for our children, our dads, our moms, our uncles, our aunts, this place we get to be together. Father, there's too much to thank you for. And we just love you. Father, we ask today that you unravel us like tight wound springs that have been manipulated and contorted in certain ways. Father, unravel us. Remind us, Lord, that we were made from the dirt. Very, very simple and that you breathe life into us. We don't give ourselves life by the things we do or by the material outside of your word that we consume. Unravel us and bring us back to our nature, which is you. We as a creation in your image, as your children. Some of us need to be reminded of that very simple fact, Lord, that we are your children. Some of us have forgotten how to be children. All of us forget how to be children. Help us to be children of yours today, Father, to remember what that is. Thank you for your mercy on us today. And we just want to lift your name on high above everything else here in the mountains in Colorado in the beautiful clouds and the wonderful nature that you provide all around us. We want to lift your name over it and honor you as the creator of everything that exists. We thank you, Lord, and we pray all of these prayers in the name of your precious, precious Son, our Lord and our Savior in this life, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let's sing.
Grab your bulletins, if you would, this morning. First of all, we want to say welcome. We are glad that you're here worshiping with us. If you're a guest with us, we want to say welcome. And, and I would ask that you do us one favor. There is a connection card uh, in your bulletin. If you wouldn't mind grabbing that, filling that out with as much information as you can, um, you can drop it in the offering plate. Or if it's your first time with us, you have the option you can hang on to that. At the end of service, go out these doors, head towards our coffee and donut section, and somebody in the kitchen will trade you. You give them your connection card, they'll give you a gift just for just as a thank you for being our guest this morning. Um, also want to uh, draw your attention to some, the, some events that are going on on the inside colored page uh, there. I believe the first one, I'm going to ask Devin to come on up and, and help make a, a, a children's ministry announcement. Good morning, everyone. I'm Devin Spaulding. My husband Craig and I go to church here and our two little girls, Sloan and Spencer. Um, I'm here to just let you know about our children's ministry. Um, one of the main reasons that we continue to come to this church, not only because of all of you and your family, but is because we have um, child care during church, and they have a chance to get to know the Lord a little better. Um, and that's how we kind of got involved in this church, is because we got the opportunity to volunteer in our children's ministry. And so speaking of that, we are looking for new volunteers. Um, some weeks we have 80 kids in the ministry, and so we need a lot of volunteers. Um, but just so you know, it doesn't have to be every week. It doesn't have to be all services. So you can do one service at 930 or 11. You can do it every other week. Um, or if you just want to be a fill-in, we need those all the time too because Craig and I do go on vacation. Some other people do as well. So um, if you are interested, please reach out to myself, my husband Craig, um, or Miss Kate. She has long, beautiful blonde hair, and she'd love to talk to you guys about just getting a background check done, and then they'll put you on the schedule or just put you in as a fill-in. So. Um, please pray about being a volunteer for children's ministry. Thank you. Thank you, Devin. Yeah, uh, Kate uh, told me, she said, the summer slump is definitely over when it comes to the children's ministry. They, they've been having about 40 kids during the summer and that kind of thing. I guess last week they went, they jumped back up to 80, and I have no idea how many they have over there uh, this morning. But yeah, they could definitely use the help. Also wanted to give a thank you to, I, I believe Lenny said we had about 30 people uh, that came to our uh, work day yesterday. And so uh, thank you guys very much for showing up and, and doing your part on the, on the new building. We're, we're making progress over there. So um, so you'll hear about the next workday coming up and, and uh, hopefully it'll be just as successful and, and we'll continue to, to plan them well and, and you guys continue to show up and we'll, we'll have that building done before we know it. You know, it's, it's always one of those things where you, you think, oh, it's never going to get done and oh, it's going to be forever and everything. And, you know, at some point you're going to be in there going, I can't believe we're in here. <laughs> and, and then all of that stuff that happened in the past is in the past and that's awesome. Hey, how are you? I was, like, I was like, that's a face I haven't seen in a long time. How you doing? <laughs> anyway, uh, not to, not to, not to uh, make specific, oh, hi, how are you? I'm here, i, I got to include somebody else. Hi, Dennis. No. <laughs> Sorry, all right, moving on. Uh, other announcements, uh, if you look inside your bulletin there, in the middle you'll see there's a... Uh, now, there's a state of the state gathering. If you'd like to go to that, there is a, there's information there. Um, what it is, it's, it's a gathering at a church in Glenwood where you're going to hear some updates on what's going on in the, at the state government level and how we as the, the faith community can be a part of that and, and help with that. So that's going to be Tuesday at 3 p.m. if you'd like to go uh, to that. Also, uh, an opportunity for you if you'd like to join some of our families that are going to our um, a family retreat up at TP Bible Camp. It's August. I'm sorry, September second through the fourth. Um, if you'd like to go, your family uh, can go. It's pretty pretty uh, inexpensive. It's thirty five dollars for an adult, eighteen dollars for kids. That includes your lodging and all your food while you're there, and all the activities are free to to, to do and participate. So. I know we've got several families that are going that weekend. If you'd like to go and join them, you can have fun with your family and with some of your church family um, as well. And I think, is there any more? Oh, yes, a uh, reminder that our, our outdoor service is August 14th. That's only a couple of weeks away. Can you believe August 14th is only a couple of weeks away? Where did, oh, my goodness. Anyway. Uh -huh. Uh, don't even start, right? Um, so uh, just, for, just a reminder, on that day, we don't have three services. We only have one, uh, one time that we gather together. We gather over here in our backyard, uh, the, the fenced-in grass area. Uh, we have an outdoor service followed by fun activities for adults and children, um, followed by a lunch together. Um, we're also going to have the opportunity to baptize quite a few people. We've got some kids and teenagers and, and even adults, and we're going to do it 
uh, old southern southern style by doing it in a horse trough out there. So um, we uh, we might even uh, we might even try to put warm water. I don't know, probably not. Anyway, <laughs> but no, we're, we're going to have a good and awesome time together as a family. So make sure you plan on joining us for that. That's August fourteenth. All right, uh, stand with me if you would again and, and cross an aisle and, and shake a hand of someone you haven't seen in a long time or somebody you're just introducing yourself to.
may be seated. All right. So if, you, if you'd like to turn in your Bibles, you can turn to 2 Peter, uh, 2 Peter uh, chapter, glasses, chapter 1. <laughs> 2 Peter chapter 1, we're, we're continuing in our coffee shop talk series, which is basically, if you, if you don't know what that is, it's, it's over the last couple of months, we collected questions from the church. So the church people, you guys got to submit questions, and they could have been about anything, you know, from aliens to, 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 to why does this, you know, one of the ones we're going to answer today is, is why are there weird words found in Psalm 119, right? And so uh, we're we're answering a couple of those this morning. This morning, we're going to be answering questions that are specifically about the Bible. Not so much what does the Bible say about this, but but about the Bible itself. Why? How did we get the Bible? So let's look at these questions we're going to answer this morning. Number one, who decided what books would be part of the canon? Okay, canon meaning the standard, the, um, this is what is considered the, the, the word of God, and, and why did some writings get put into the Bible, and why did other writings not get included? Um, who made that decision? And, and what, the, the, what the, the spirit of that question really is, is can I trust the scriptures? Can I trust that the word of God is really the word of God? As a matter of fact, uh, my daughter and, 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 and Mike, uh, her boyfriend, were telling me just last night that they were talking to somebody who, who said, yeah, I believe in God and I believe in Jesus, but I struggle with the idea of the Bible being God's word considering that m- man's involvement it pol- must have polluted it in some way, right? That it can't be trusted because the church is corrupt and, and this and that. So the real question is how can we trust that this is the word of God. So we're going we're gonna to talk primarily about that. Then we're going to talk about some, some oddities that are found in, by, in the Bible. The, the second question I, that I, we're going to deal with is, is there a reason Chronicles repeats a lot of kings? First and second Chronicles and first and second Kings, there's a lot of overlap. There's even a lot of overlap with second Samuel as well. And so we're going we're gonna to answer that question. And then the third one there is Psalm 119 sections are highlighted with words like Aleph, Beth, Gimel, et cetera, et cetera. What does that mean? What are, what are the, what are the pur- what's the purpose of that? So we're going we're gonna to talk about that. So let's, first of all, let's talk about the scripture itself, the Bible itself. How did we get it? How can we trust it? Because isn't that, shouldn't that be a foundational thing for us? Guys, if we can't trust that this is the word of God, that this is, that, that this is God's revelation to us, then what are we all doing here, <laughs> right? This, if this isn't the word of God, this is the longest drawn out book club I've ever seen, right? <laughs> and at some point we should move on, <laughs> right? But it's not, it, it's, so, so how do we trust that? So how did we get the Bible that we have today? There's three steps to that process. Step number one was the authorship, right? At some point, somebody had to write words down on paper, okay? The second step is the canonization. In other words, how did these 66 books get, become accepted as the word of God at the exclusion of other things, okay? And then the third way is translation. None of the Bible was written in English, so it was all, the Old Testament was in Hebrew, the New Testament was in Greek and Aramaic, so all of it had to get translated for us to have Bibles that we can read here today, okay? So let's start with authorship. How did, how did the Bible get written in the first place? You need to understand the Bible was written by over 40-something authors. We, now, we can't get, put an exact number to it because there's certain books that we don't know who the author is. Like some people would say that the book of Hebrews was written by Peter. Some people would say it was written by others. So if it was written by Peter, that would, that would lower the number of authors. If it was written by somebody else, it would raise it. But we know that there's at least over 40 authors, over a span of several thousand years, okay? So how did we get it? Well, we believe there's two parts to the authorship of of the Scripture. Number one is inspiration. 2 Peter 1.21 says this, For no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Okay? What is inspiration? Inspiration is the Holy Spirit moving through man to deliver God's word. Now, that means there's going, to be some, there's going to be some variation, right? When you read a letter that's written by Paul, it reads differently than a letter that was written by James, right? Just like if you and I wrote a letter, if, if Jose decided, hey, I'm gonna write a letter, his language, his syntax, his vocabulary is gonna be different than mine. 
If I were to write a letter, I'm not gonna have nearly as many bros as, <laughs> as, as Jose's is, right? Uh, <laughs> right? If you know Jose, if you've known Jose longer than 30 seconds, you know exactly what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. So, sorry, brother. I got, I, I, you're an easy target, because right? I know you can take it. I know you can take it. Right? But it's going gonna, it's gonna to have the flavor. So in other words, it's going to be inspired by the Holy Spirit, but it's going to be, it's going to be different depending on the person through which God inspires. We're, this is this is coffee shop talk, right? How many of you guys raise your hand if you like coffee, if you drink coffee? Okay, so a lot of you will understand this. I am not one of those people. This is not coffee in here. This is Gatorade, just so you know. Uh, but I put it in a coffee shop because I wanted to look cool. <laughs> but I can't stand coffee. I, I I've told people before anything that requires an an, an, an acquired taste. The first time I had coffee, I thought, "Ooh, that's dirty bitter bean water. I don't want that." <laughs> right? And that's that's been my. <laughs> some people are some people are laughing. Some people are looking at me like, "How dare you?" But isn't that really what it is? Yes. We've taken beans, we've roasted them, we've ground them up, and then we poured water through them, hoping that the beans would contaminate the water. And that's what it's done. It's dirty bean water. That's all it is. I don't care what you put it in. <laughs> And it tastes delicious, sure, okay, good, that's fine. You can believe that if you want. Everybody has the right to be wrong, but, <laughs> all right? But the way that, but you get different flavors of coffee because it's, the, the beans are different, they're roasted differently or the, that kind of thing. So depending on the beans that you're using, it's going to flavor the coffee different, right? The water can still be the same, but when it gets filtered through the different, kind, the different grounds, it'll have a different flavor. Same thing in scripture. The water is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. It's the inspiration of God. And the man is the dirty beans <laughs> that filter. So when you, read the, when you read the scriptures, you can tell the difference between things that were written by Moses versus things that were written by Paul, right? And it's not that, it's not that that makes them wrong or that kind of thing, but it's that it's that you can see that, that God is using the creativity and the minds of different men, 40 plus different authors, to tell a cohesive story. Now, that in itself is a miracle. Do you understand how much of that is, an, is a miracle? 40 different authors over a span of thousands of years, like 1,500 years, all writing a cohesive story. Do you understand how difficult that is? We can't even do that in movies today. How many times have we rebooted Spider-Man? I mean, and, and I know if Brandon were here, he'd be like, oh, well, they brought it all together in the last one. They had all the different spots. Whatever, man. That's a desperate attempt to make, keep making money, right? You know, you look, uh, oh, by the way, there's going to be a lot of movie references in this sermon. Just, you know, I'm a movie buff, so if you want to, it's a little side game. You can count how many there are, and we'll see if you're right at the end. Here's another one. Uh, how about, how about the, the Star Wars sequels, Right? You, we couldn't even tell a cohesive story over three movies over a span of six years. The guy in the middle completely changed and wrecked the whole thing, in my opinion, right? So we can't, we can't tell a cohesive story. Look at the comic book world. Anytime you get another Arthur coming in, they completely change everything. So you need to understand how miraculous it is that the scriptures are as cohesive as they are. With that many different authors and that much time spent this, the, the, the authorship of the Bible itself is a miracle of God. You understand that? Okay? So the first part of authorship is that inspiration. The second part is inerrancy. Inerrancy. Where does, where does the idea of an inerrancy comes from? Well, it comes from a couple of things. It's a math equation. It's the character of God plus the revelation of God. The character of God, it says in Hebrews 6.18 that it is impossible for God to lie. Therefore, if it's impossible for God to lie, therefore, anything he says must be what? The truth. If it's impossible for you to lie, anything you say must be the truth. Here's another movie reference. Have you ever seen Liar, Liar? Uh, it's a goofy movie about a Jim Carrey movie about a, his son makes a wish on his birthday that I wish for one day only my father couldn't tell a lie. And so all of a sudden, this, this lawyer who makes a living off lying has to tell the truth all the time, and, it, 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 and chaos ensues. There's one part in there that, that, that's kind of funny to me. At one point, he, he, he tells something to the judge, and the judge says, is that really true? And he says, it must be, because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to say it, 
right? He didn't, he didn't even know it was true. He was taking a shot in the dark, but the fact that he was able to say it at that moment said he, it must be true, right? Okay, so the character of God says that he cannot lie. Everything that he says is true. Therefore, his revelation must be true, okay? I like to say it this way. Inerrancy is this. The scriptures, properly interpreted, are shown to be true in what they affirm. Okay, I throw that properly interpreted in there because we all know that we can, we can make mistakes in interpretation, can't we? we uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about that. We talked about there was a passage in Hebrews that some people look at it and they would say, oh, see, you can lose your salvation, and there, but there's other places in the Bible that says you can't. That means the Bible has errors in it, and that, that means there's a contradiction. It's like, no, that means you're misinterpreting this scripture, and here's why, right? So the Bible, when properly interpreted, is true in what it affirms, okay? What in, so what isn't inerrancy? I wanna, I wanna clear some things up. Inerrancy is not, it's not identical accounts, right? If, if, if I'm gonna pick on Jose again, because I've already picked him, I might as well just stick with it and I'll, I'll, I'll ask for your forgiveness later. Uh, if Jose and I witnessed the same thing, let's say we were standing on the street corner and we witnessed a car accident, and he, I was on this corner and he was on that corner. And the police came and interviewed both of us. Do we have any realistic expectation that both of us are going to tell the exact same story? We both witnessed the same event, but with him being over here and me being over here and, and us being different people, we were probably going to get the facts of what happened. Yeah, this, it was this guy's fault because he ran the light and that kind of thing. But our perspectives are going to be different, aren't they? Therefore, when we tell the story, our, it's, going to be, it's going to look slightly different. So when you go to the Gospels, say, and you see, you see something that is written in the Gospel of Matthew versus the, the, the same story that was, that was recorded in the Gospel of John, it's a realistic expectation that they're going to be slightly different, isn't it? As a matter of fact, there are, there are forensic scientists that, that have said if they, were, if they were too exact, it would actually be discrediting to them as a witness, the value of a witness statement. If they're too exact, it means they got together and they got their story straight, right? It's a plot. The fact that they're different, it actually speaks to their, to their validity as eyewitness accounts, okay? So inerrancy is, does not mean identical accounts. It doesn't mean strict grammar or implied precision, right? It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean exact wording or identical styles. It doesn't mean scientific language. I've had some people say, well, the Bible is, is, is full of errors because there are, there are things in there that can't be true. And, the, and they'll cite this thing where this guy says, oh, well, a cubit is this. And they'll go to scientific measurement and see it got this wrong. That's an error in the Bible. So I'm going to throw the whole thing out. Okay. That's not what inerrancy is. Inerrancy is, is talking about what, in what it affirms to be true, the voice of God, that's where it's without error. Now, there's going to be times in there where the, the ancient authors don't know how to describe things. You guys, think about it in Revelation. There's an, there's a, there's an account in Revelation, the, the, gospel, the, the apostle John was given a vision of the future. How would an ancient man accurately describe modern warfare? Would he even have the language? Would he have any idea? There's, there's a part of the Bible where it talks about in the Battle of Armageddon as, as, if, there, as if there were uh, grasshoppers made of iron. Have you guys ever seen a Black Hawk helicopter? And the, the way it moves, it comes up, and then it lands again over here. As an ancient man, how would he describe that? Do you think he knows what a Black Hawk helicopter is? Do you think he has any clue what a helicopter is? <laughs> how would he describe it? He might use a grasshopper made of iron, right? He's using his language. So, so it's not, that's not what inerrancy is. Oh, well, it must be wrong because of this. Let's, let's remember who the authors were, what, where they were, and, and their limitations. Remember, it's been filtered through, it's God's word filtered through the man of the times that, that, wrote, that wrote it down, okay? So we have the authorship is inspiration and inerrancy. Let's talk about canonization. How did we get to these books as opposed, how did we get to these 66 books as, a, as opposed to a bunch of other writings as well? Uh, first of all, there's a few misconceptions. One misconception is that there was a bunch of early Christian uh, sects or, um, uh, or, or groups that were, that were fighting for position and the winner is the one that got to pick the, the, the scriptures and the letters that they liked. The winner uh, got to rewrite history and say, 
well, we're gonna we're gonna discount this stuff, and but we're gonna keep this stuff because it agrees with what we what, what, with what we believe. Guys, I want you to understand that is not the way it happened. The corruption of the early church, and and when you talk about the corruption of the Catholic Church, that kind of thing, all that stuff took place well after the the, the canon was already established. Okay, the better question is not who picked the the canon; it was more who discovered the canon. I want you to understand that it was, it was man that discovered the, the authentic works of God, not man who decided the authentic, what was going to be authentic and what was going to be God's work. Okay, they discovered that. And how did they, how did they do that? Um, first, of all, first of all, let me ask you this. Why, why did they need to? Was it important that they say, okay, this is the standard, this is what we're going to stick with? First of all, let me ask you this. Do you think that everything that Paul wrote was Scripture? Do you think that every letter Paul wrote to anyone should be considered God's holy word? Did, did Paul, was Paul still human or did he somehow become the voice of God like the archangel or the, or the, the angel Gabriel? Did, it, did everything that came out of Paul's mouth, was it supposed to be treated as God's word? I don't, I'm, not, I'm not seeing nearly enough head shaking. I, I want you to, was Paul still human? Everybody do this. Did Paul still make mistakes? Everybody do this. Did everything that Paul ever say or write count as the word of God? Everybody do this, <laughs> right? We have a lot, we have, we, have, we have other letters and stuff that, that are preserved in history that were Paul, letters written by Paul, but they aren't considered scripture because they didn't meet certain qualifications. Now, it doesn't mean he was writing bad things or that kind of thing, but it just wasn't important enough that, to say this is the word of God, right? And so we had, to, we had to discover that difference. But why was it important that we... Why was it important that we, that we did this? Number one, um, the reason for it is there was value in preserving Scripture for future gen generations. Guys, if they, hadn't, if they hadn't done some of this to, to gather and protect this, we wouldn't have the Bibles of, that we have today. Okay? So it's, it's, it's important that they did. It's beneficial to us as believers that they did. Number two, the early church needed instruction just like we do. They needed instruction just like we do. So, so these, these letters and these things that were written as scripture were passed around to other churches because there was all these other churches. We're, we're studying in, in our men's Bible study on Tuesday night. We're studying the book of Titus, right? And Titus was sent by Paul to the, the island of Crete where there was all these churches that had sprung up, but they didn't have the instruction. that They, they didn't have the leaders and they didn't have the instruction that they needed. So Paul said, hey, I want you to go and establish leaders. And then they sent these letters and they passed them around. They made extra copies and they, they passed them around to these other churches because they needed instructions just like we do today. They actually had it harder than we have it today because we have it all compiled together and put together all neat, nice and neat for us already. They didn't have that advantage. Okay? Number three, the, the reason why... The, the, they wanted to counter the rise of heretics, propagating their own version of Scripture. There were, there were people that were like, hey, this, 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 this whole, this whole uh, uh, religion gig is kind of cool. These guys, are, they've, got, they've got hundreds, thousands of people following them, and they're wielding power over them. And look, they can convince them to give them money. And, and there are heretics that will take that, take that idea and they will propagate a different version of the gospel to deceive people so that they can, they can personally gain from that. Now, that doesn't happen at all today, does it? Yeah, there are certain channels on your TV that are full of people that I believe are taking advantage and they're, they're, they're propagating a version of religion that is easier to swallow and that looks better and is more attractive and they're, make, they're getting rich off of it. Okay? There's a reason why they, they, they said, you know what, we need, to, we need to have a defense against these heretics. They're going to come in with their own version of Scripture and try to, and try to mislead and deceive for personal gain. Okay, the fourth reason is that there was the need for missions. They were given a great commission. They were told, go and make disciples. And if you're going to go and make disciples, you need to be able to instruct them. He says, he says teaching them all that I have commanded you. It was important to have a Bible to be able to share with them and say, listen, this is the story of God. This is the story of God's redemption of mankind. We still see that value today. The whole idea, the whole the whole. Gideon organization 
The Gideons, are their, their whole mission is to get the word of God in the hands of as many people as possible. Why? Because there's power in the word of God. The power to change their life. And even if they can't, even if they never talk to a missionary, even if they never walk into a church, if they find a Bible in a hotel room or on the street corner, somebody threw it out of their car and they find it out of the ditch. I've heard some of these stories where they they get the word of God in their hands and it changes their life. You see, the the need for missions was there. And without, without a scripture to share that story with people, That mission work is so much harder. The fifth reason is to survive the rising levels of persecution. There was a a persecution that rose up, and there there were people that tried to put to death the Christian faith, and they went after the Scriptures. They tried to remove it. They tried to to restrict it, and, and so they needed to know exactly what was important enough to protect. Oh, this other letter from Paul that was written to some guy about, hey, uh, make sure you pick up my laundry before you come to Thessalonica because I need some dry cleaning picked up. That, but that, that, we can let that go, but this letter we're going to protect. You guys see the difference? They needed to establish what is worth protecting for for those future generations. Okay, so how how were these discovered? Guys, I want you to understand, there, there there were early, and if you study church history, you can find these early church councils. They called them councils or, um, or synods. Uh, a lot of these are, are words we don't use anymore, like the synod of hippo. <laughs> some, people would be, some people would be like, wait, what, we have to go to the zoo now? What, what, what part of the hippo? Uh, no, uh, the Synod of Hippo it was a gathering of, of church leaders, and they, they had to come together, and they had to make some, some declarations. They had to put some things straight. Uh, just to give you a brief history, um, the Council of Laodicea was in 363 A.D., and they were basically saying, hey, they, they forbade the use of several non-canonical uh, canonical, canonical books. That's a really hard word to say. Basically, they were saying, hey, some of you guys are using books as if they're the word of God, and you shouldn't be, and they, so they forbade the use of those. Um, there was another, the Council of Hippo in 393 cited the 27 books of the New Testament as canon. The Synod of Carthage in 397 stated that only canon should be used in churches. That's why there are some churches today, they're like, well, turn with me to the, to the book of Enoch. You know, or other things that are included in the Apocrypha. Um, there's, all, there's all these other books that are available out there, but the, the problem is they shouldn't be considered Scripture because they don't match up with God's Word. And we're going to talk about how do we know, how, how can I stand here and say, maybe you've got a copy of the Apocrypha at home. I don't consider the Apocrypha the Word of God, and here's why, because they don't match up with the rules of inclusion I want to share with you. What are the rules of inclusion? How should we know what to use and what not to use? Rule number one, was it written by a prophet or an apostle of God? Was it written by a prophet or an apostle of God? Was it written by someone who has the authority to teach with authority? You understand what I'm talking about? You know, when, in the early church, it says they, they, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings because the apostles had been established by God as the first leaders of the church. Okay, they were the eyewitnesses. They were the ones that walked with Jesus during his ministry. Okay, R- inclusion uh, rule number two, was the writer confirmed by acts of God? When you look at a lot of the things that the prophets wrote and that sort of thing, God used them and, and it was almost like their resume. You know, God said, I, I, I want you to listen to this guy because here, I'm going to give him the ability to do, mor- to do miraculous things. I'm going to prove that he's my emissary by doing this, this, and this. Okay, so was the, was the writer confirmed by acts of God? Number three, did the message tell the truth about God? Guys, I've read a lot of the, I haven't read through the whole thing of the Apocrypha, or I know other churches, they'll, they'll use the Book of Mormon as, as, as scripture and that kind of thing. Guys, I can throw a lot of those out just by reading them because they don't tell the truth about God. They're not talking about the same God. I do not, you know, you'll, you may have some Mormon friends that tell you that they're Christian too, They do not worship the same God we do. And their scriptures prove that very clearly. Okay? So does it tell the truth about God? Number number four, does it come with the power of God? Does it come? Guys, do you you understand the power this book has? Here we are 2,000 years later still talking about it. (laughs) Why? Because it ch- it's changed our lives. Here, here's another movie reference if you're keeping count. How many of you guys have ever seen the book of Eli? 
But I, li I like the I like that movie. I, I know it's got it's not the great movie. It's not the greatest movie. But anyway, I like. There's parts of it. The bad guy, post-apocalyptic. Uh, they've they've destroyed all the books. They've specifically destroyed all the Bibles. Nobody can find a Bible anywhere. The bad guy wants this one certain book because why? Because he understood that it represented power. Now he wanted it so that he could manipulate people and become more of a more of a dictator and, and they would bow to his will if he could just explain it through this book and all this other stuff. But the, what they were doing, that, that movie was recognizing the power of the word of God. You cannot deny that. Again, we talked about how people would find you know, an old Bible. I heard the story of, of, a, of a, a young man in Nepal who found, it was like, it was as if the, the gospel of uh, Luke had gotten torn out of a Bible. Have you ever had like a binding go bad? Uh, I've got my, I've got a Bible at home that, um, that I, yeah, there you go. <laughs> I've got a Bible at home that Exodus sometimes makes an Exodus. <laughs> it's like, you go, you go flipping through and all of a sudden Exodus is like, get out! <laughs> it, it falls away. Basically, the gospel of Luke had been removed from a Bible, and that was the only scripture he had, and he got saved through it. And when he was shown a full, a full Bible later, it, it was the most joyous thing of his life because he said, there's more to this story? This is awesome. There's power in the word of God. And number five, was it accepted by the people of God? Guys, I want you to understand that by the time they got to these synods and these councils and these gatherings, the, the 66 books of the Bible were already accepted as truth. They just put a stamp on it and said, we're making it official. Because the people of God had already accepted, they had already recognized the power of the scripture. Guys, it was not decided, it was discovered. Do we understand the difference? Okay, so that's the canonization. Third step in the process is translation. Remember, I talked about none of it was written in English, so everything had to be translated. There are three styles of translation. There's word-for-word -word translation, there's phrase-by-phrase -phrase translation, and there's paraphrase, okay? And they all have their different uses. And I suggest you get into the habit of using more than one version of the Bible, okay? What are they good for? The word-for-word -word translation is good for building doctrine, to, for finding the true meaning of things, okay? Uh, when I, when I want to know what does God really have to say, I want to know why it was this word used as opposed to this word. The Greek and the Hebrew are much more descriptive in their language than English is. I'll give you an example. I love my dog. I love cheeseburgers. I love my wife. I'm using love for all three of those. Am I describing three different things? I certainly hope so. Otherwise, I'm going to look at my dog and think, oh, he might be good in between, a bu in between two buns and with some ketchup on him. Right? <laughs> oh, gross. I don't want to know that, dude. <laughs> right? We, we, use, we use the same word for love, but there's a reason why Paul uses different words. There's a reason why in the Greek we see, we see different words. We see philos. We see agape. We see eros. We see, we see there, there's these different words that, that we translate them as love, but they mean different things. So if I want to know exactly what the meaning of a scripture is, I'm going to go to a word-for-word -word translation that knows the difference between agape and philos, right? I don't want one that just says, you should love your brother. I want to know what kind of love. What is this really saying? So when I'm going to build a doctrine, and what doctrine is, is a truth that then speaks into my life. It's going to serve as framework for my life. That's, what, that's what I, how I see doctrine. If I'm going to build doctrine, I'm going to do it from a word-for-word -word translation. Now, what's the, what's the, good, what's the value in the phrase-by-phrase? Phrase-by-phrase is better at readability, right? It reads smoother. What phrase-by-phrase -phrase is saying, listen, I'm going to look at this phrase, and I'm going to carry over the meaning of the phrase and at the cost of some of the individual meaning of individual words. I'm going to get the idea across one phrase at a time. And, and, and a phrase by phrase, it, it reads easier. We saw this as, a, as an example in our, our men's Bible study two weeks ago. We, we were, were, were walking through verse by verse through the book of Titus. And we looked at the first four verses of Titus. And, and you look at those first four verses, and there's something like 150 words in there or whatever. And, and we looked at it in a word for word translation. And we were like, okay, Paul is the king of run on sentences. Basically, in the first four verses, Paul was saying, 
Hi, I'm Paul. This is to Titus. Hello. Right? That's, what, that's really what he was saying. Paul is writing this to Titus. Hi. Okay? But he took four verses and 170-something words to do it because Paul is always like, I, Paul, the, an emissary of Christ by this. You know? and, and so what we did is we went, for, we went with the word-for-word -word translation saying, okay, what is this? What is this comma? What is this section talking about? Okay, this is talking about Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, an emissary of the gospel. What is this section that says, which is, which is valuable? And oh, that's talking about the gospel. And, and we diagrammed that whole thing out to truly understand what all of these things, otherwise this big run-on sentence, you're like, wait, what are we talking about now? And so we did that through the word-for-word -word translation. And at the end of it, everybody was kind of like, okay, Okay, I think, yeah, he was talking about his purpose there, and, you know, I think we got it. And then I said, okay, now I want to read this to you from a phrase-by-phrase -phrase translation, and I read the same four verses, and there were people in the circle that were like, oh, that was so much easier. Why didn't you just start with that? <laughs> I was like, well, yeah, now that you've got to understand the meaning, this, the readability of this is easier. But fast forward to the next week. The very next week, we read a passage out of a phrase by phrase. We were talking, it was, the, it was the list of character qualities that elders and pastors should have. And the phrase by phrase at one point made it sound like two of those qualities were for a different person. And you go to the word for word and you realize, no, those qualities are still talking about the elder, not the elder's children. Right? So even though it was easier to read in the phrase by phrase, you lost a little bit of the meaning when, until you went back to the word for word. Right? All right, now what's the paraphrase for? A paraphrase is basically a, a guy or a small group of guys telling you their version of Scripture. Do you, you guys remember in, in school, have, were you ever given the assignment to rewrite this paragraph in your own words? Do you remember that, something like that? And you basically, you had to get the gist of it. You know, uh, you know, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. And you, you, they, they weren't asking you to just transcribe it and rewrite the whole thing. They're asking you to tell the story in your words. You say, okay, a brother and sister named Jack and Jill, uh, they got sent to go get some water. And You see what I'm saying? You, you rewrote it in your own words. That's what a paraphrase is. Some of them are done by a collection of people. Some of them are done by a single person only. A paraphrase, it can be good for a new perspective. Maybe I, I, have, I have the living Bible and I have the message in my, in my office, and every once in a while, I'll go to those for a, a different perspective. I'm going to see, okay, what does this guy say about this scripture? And there's been times I've been like, oh, okay, that's kind of cool. I've never looked at it that way before. I never, I never saw that there before. And there's been other times I've been like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Guys, I want to let you know, if you're using a paraphrase version as your only version of scripture, come and talk to me, and I'll give you another version. It's that, I won't, you, won't, uh, you won't even have to pay for one. I'll buy it for you. It's that important that you understand that a paraphrase is, a, is oftentimes one guy's opinion of what God says. Do not build your life and doctrine off of that. Because why? Because it's subject to his interpretation. Okay, that's why you'll never see me reading or preaching or quoting the message or that kind of thing. And I, and I don't like it when other pastors do it either. To me, that's lazy exegesis. It, that's, that's lazy Bible work because it's, it's getting somebody who's saying something you want it to say, even though it may not be that, that's what that's saying, okay? The whole point of this, guys, I want you to get into the habit. If you really want to study the Word of God, get more than one version. In today's world, that is so easy. Download the app. You've got hundreds of versions at your disposal. Read more than one version, understand which one is which, or what kind, and then trust on the Holy Spirit to, to tell you the truth. Because every single one of them has their pros and cons. Everything, every single one of them has been, is subject to interpretation of man. And maybe, maybe one version might be right in one case, but might be a, a little less right in another. If you want to be a true st student of God's word, get into the habit of using more than one translation. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, that's how we, that's how we got the scripture. All right, now let's talk about, let's talk about the second question. Basically, I, I summarized it with, hey, what's up with Chronicles? <laughs> what's the deal with Chronicles? Okay, <laughs> bro, what's up with, yes, sir. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I, I'm not saying it right, I'm not saying it right. I don't. Okay, there you go. You got it. Yes, sir. 
<laughs> moving on. We're gonna move on. All right. Is there a lot of overlap in Chronicles? Yes, you need to understand that Chronicles does tell a lot of the same stories that First and Second Kings tells. First and Second Chronicles does tell a lot of the same stories that is covered in Second Samuel. Okay? Does that mean it's unnecessary and we don't need it? No, you need to understand that even though there is some overlap, over half of what we find in, in First and Second Chronicles is unique. That would be like saying we don't need the Gospel of John because most of it is covered in the other three Gospels as well. But there's a lot that's, that's covered in John that isn't covered in the other Gospels, so let's not throw it out. Okay, so what is the book of First and Second Chronicles? It was a book that I believe was written by Ezra. You guys remember Ezra? Okay, it doesn't identify that Ezra is the author in the biblical text, but we go and we see a lot of secular histories of the time, even the Babylonian Talmud, which is kind of their accounts of everything. They even attribute the, the books of 1st and 2nd Chronicles to Ezra. And what, it, what is the book? It's, it's a history of the, the, the nation of Israel with a specific focus on the southern kingdom of Judah. And it's telling a lot of the same stories because First and Second Kings tells more details from the, the, the northern kingdom's um, perspective, the kingdom of Israel, and First and Second Chronicles covers more from the southern kingdom's perspective from Judah. It, it's, it's, like, it's like the state of Colorado, we kind of have the western slope and the eastern slope, right? We're both the same state, but don't, don't you think there's a little bit of a division there? Some of us would rather just be too, we, some of us would rather just be West Colorado and, and East Colorado, right? Or as I like to call it, leftover Kansas. Anyway, um, <laughs> but if we, if we were telling the same story of what happened, we would tell it from our perspective. This is what happened when the state did this, right? And the Eastern Slope might have a different version. This is what happened from their perspective, Okay. So even though there's some overlap, there's unique perspective on both. But we also need to understand that the book of First and Second Chronicles, the, the, those books had a very specific purpose. Think about, we talked about putting things in context and everything. The historical context of what is going on is the, is the Israeli people were being brought back to the promised land after the Babylonian captivity, and they were given the task of rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, rebuilding the temple, basically reestablishing the nation of God's chosen people. And First and Second Chronicles is a book that takes the history of God's chosen people and basically is written to this group saying, look, God has proven himself faithful from Adam and Eve all the way to where we are now. And because he, pro he proved himself faithful to that group, he will prove himself faithful to this group. It was written as a, as a defense of God saying, listen, the God of your ancestors is still your God today, and he's still going to show up for you even, this, even in the face of this impossible task. Okay, so is there some overlap? Yes. Is there some, is there some differences? Absolutely. It, does it serve its own purpose? Yes, it does. To the people of Judah in that day, it was the thing that bolstered their confidence in their God. Now, does that mean, does that mean it doesn't mean anything to us or any of us? Are we trying to rebuild Jerusalem? Are we trying to rebuild the temple? Just so you know, that building over there is not a temple. <laughs> it never will be. We're the temple, right? We need to understand. So, so is, it, is it directly transferable? No. But the God who showed up for the ancient Israelites and the God that showed up for the post-exile nation, isn't he still going to show up for us? Amen. See, we can, we can learn from that. The Old Testament, the New Testament, the stories of God, that's God's resume. That's how we know we can trust him. Okay. All right, let's go on to the last one. Question number three, what's the deal with the weird stuff in Psalm 119? Turn with me, if you would, to Psalm 119. You'll see there, number one, there's some things to know about Psalm 119. Uh, tr just trivia-wise, if you ever want to know, it's the longest chapter in all of the Bible, okay? Psalm 119 is the longest physical chapter. So it's longer than anything in Genesis, longer than anything in any of the Gospels. The word count-wise and verse-wise, it's the longest chapter. It's the longest chapter in the Bible, and it's, got, it's broke up into headings. When you look in your Bible, do you see these, these headings? They're broke up. You'll notice that verses 1 through 8 is under the word Aleph, right? 9 through 16 is under the word Beth. 
Then you got 17 through 24 is Gimel, okay? There are 22 different sections. Now, in today's world, we may look at that and we're like, dude, I don't know what that means. That, are, are these like special code words or anything? Here, let me clue you in. How many letters are in our alphabet? 26. Therefore, everything must be the same as ours, right? No. <laughs> How many letters are in the Hebrew alphabet? 22. There are 22 sections in Psalm 119. Let me ask you another question. What do you think the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet is? How did you know? What do you think the second letter in the Hebrew alphabet is? Beth, right? Okay, guys, you need to understand, Psalm 119 is an acrostic. You know what an acrostic is? If I were to take all 26 letters of our alphabet, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, an acrostic would be every sentence would start with that letter. You know, I, I would have a sentence that started with an A. The next one, I would have a sentence that started with a B. We do this all the time as a way to remember things, as a way to make things easier to put together. Like, if I were to tell you, uh, how do you share your faith? You share with them the, your, the ABCs. Admit that you're a sinner. Believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins and confess him with your mouth, right? It's easier to remember when we can do it as an acrostic. Now, you may look at this and say, okay, all right, verse 1. That starts with a J. That doesn't start with an A. Translation, right? Verse 2, that starts with a J too. Cool. We're, so we're, we're getting started good. Verse 3, that starts with a T. That doesn't work. Remember, the original verses were written. All, all eight of those original verses started with the Hebrew letter Aleph. The next eight verses started with the Hebrew letter Beth. The next eight verses started with the Hebrew letter Gimel. And, and so what is, what is this? This is the Holy Spirit. Remember, we talked about inspiration. We're pouring water through the filter of a man, of an author. This is the author putting together truths about God in a way that was easier to remember and understand by putting together this long acrostic where each eight section of eight verses started with that letter of their alphabet. And you'll find that throughout Psalm 119. This is not the only acrostic found in Scripture. Did you know that Proverbs 31, verses 10 through 31, is the same thing? It's an acrostic. You, you, may, you may recognize those verses as the, 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 the story of the virtuous wife, right? These, these, these verses are used all the time at weddings or at funerals of a, late, a lady's funeral, that kind of thing, talking about this is a, vir, a virtuous wife. That, too, was a, an acrostic. But instead of using eight verses per letter, they only used one verse per letter. Did you know the entire book of Lamentations is a very complex acrostic? Verse 1 uses a pattern of two of this, two of this letter, two of this letter, two of this letter. Verse chapter 2 is it uses a different pattern. The whole book of Lamentations, each chapter is a different version of an acrostic. What were they using? It was God pouring his truth through the filter of a man and man was using all the tricks they could to get his word across in a way that people could remember and could use in their life. Does God still do that today? Can God still? I want to share a, a story with you. Um, I did a, uh, I was part of a, a, of a mission team. We did a mission trip to a little town called Rufus, Oregon. Rufus, Oregon was one of those, uh, one of those little towns that it's an exit off the highway. It was, it's on uh, I-84 uh, right next to the, the the Columbia River, just on the northern edge of, of Oregon. And it's the kind of place that if you miss the exit, you miss the town. You may not even notice there was a town there. When we went to Rufus, we, the navigation could get us to the exit, and as soon as we got off, the navigation just kind of turned itself off. It was just like, dude, you're on your own from here. I don't know. It, it a tiny little town. But we went to, we went to this little church, and we, it, was a, it was a youth mission trip. We had 20-something teenagers with us, and we got permission from the pastor. He said, hey, each night, we're going to get together, and we're going we're gonna to do some worship, and we're going to do some testimonies, and we're going to do some teaching. We're going to encourage our kids. And I said, can we do that each night? And he said, oh, yeah, sure. You can use the sanctuary and do that. Well, the first night we did it, uh, the first night we were there was a Sunday night. Uh, the ladies who had fed us dinner, um, they, they, they had, a, they had a, um, a fellowship hall down in the basement. They were down cleaning up from dinner, and they heard the music going on upstairs, so they came up and joined us. And they, they, they really enjoyed it and everything. And, and so they came back the next night, and they brought a bunch of their friends. All of a sudden, we went from three or four uh, ladies to there was about 15 people that came and joined us. By the third night, I would say 90% of this church was there. 
There was 20 something of us. There was probably 45 to 50 of, of them. And they were joining us. And, and the pastor heard about it. And the pastor heard that we were using some of that new unsanctioned devil music <laughs> is what he called it. This is the kind of church that they only used. They had hymnals in the back. They did do some praise choruses is what they called it. And, but the, the most modern, I looked in there, they had a little, one of those little spiraled notebook uh, song books in the back of their pews. And I looked at it, the most modern uh, chorus I could find in there was Seek Ye First. You guys remember that? That, 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 that curse, Seek Ye First? <laughs> um, so uh, something written in the 70s, I think, right? Okay, well, by the third night, we had so many people there that I got in trouble. Pastor pulled me into the office uh, the next morning and said, hey, um, I, I gave you permission to do worship and that kind of thing, but I didn't give you permission to use that kind of music. And I said, okay, well, what's wrong with it? And he explained to me that the hymns, the old songs, those were inspired by the Holy Spirit, that they, they told the truth about God. And, and this new stuff, this new stuff is just loud and it's not even really music. All the horrible things you could think of, that's what, that's, that was his position. And I said, well, you know, I, I'm... I said, if you want to tell your church not to come, that's fine, but you gave me permission to lead my youth, and this is how we worship. I said, if I changed all those hymns, they wouldn't know a single one of them. And that, this is, so we're going to go ahead and keep worshiping the way we, so the compromise was he was going to tell his church not to come. And guess what they did? They came anyway. They came anyway. So I, the next day, I was in trouble again. He pulled me into his office again. This isn't going to work. They're going to come anyway, and I don't want you infecting my people with this music. And I finally asked him, I said, I said, Pastor, I said, Pastor, let me ask you a question. I said, do you believe in, I said, these hymns uh, in the hymn book and these old choruses and that kind of thing? I said, do you believe that the Holy Spirit was involved in that? I said, do you believe that the Holy Spirit worked through the creativity of of these authors and these songwriters to put these things together and that God can use them to proclaim your, his truth to his people? Absolutely. I, yes, I do. I said, okay, let me ask you one more question. Do you believe the Holy Spirit retired in 1982? He said, well, no, of course not. Is it possible that the Holy Spirit can continue to share in and speak into the lives of musicians and authors and poets that can, they can still share the truth about God set to modern music? Do you believe that that's, that that's possible? And he said, well, I guess so. And I said, okay, then by your permission, we're going to keep singing our songs. <laughs> and he, all of a sudden he was like, uh, 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 okay. <laughs> Guys, what is Psalm 119? It is the inspiration of the Holy Spirit using the creativity of an author to proclaim God's truth in a way that made sense to the, to the, the original audience in a way that they could easily wrap their head around it and remember it and use it for their own worship. Guys, isn't that what worship is? Aren't we using someone else's poetry to express to God how we feel? You know what? You are beautiful beyond description too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depths of your love? Guys, those are not my words, but they express how I feel about God. Those were words that were written by somebody else that I learned singing in church and because it connected with me and it spoke the truth of how I feel about my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, it connected with me in, a, in an emotional way and in a powerful way. That's what Psalm 119 is. And the acrostics are there, which, which made better sense to those that were Hebrew, but now we can understand it. Guys, isn't that what the, the Bible is? Uh, you, guys, I want you, we've answered these questions and they've all been about the Bible. What I really want you to get from today so I want you to fall in love with this book. You know, the, the general story of this book can be told very quickly. I can tell you that this is the, this is the story of God. It's how, it tells us how God created us, how we fell away from him, and how God used his, 
his son and through his love decided to redeem all of mankind. That's what this story is all about. But yet I can spend my entire life and never exhaust the, the beauty that can be found in here. I want you to fall in love with this book. I want you to read it. I want you to read it more than once. I want you to read it in more than one translation. I want you to study it. I want you to look at each individual word. I want you to, I want you to, there, there's even places in here that you're going to, that are going to confuse you. <laughs> I had somebody ask me last night, they said, hey, I was reading through Genesis chapter six and I got to this part about the Nephilim. Can you explain that to me? And I said, you know what? I'm going to cover that in, an, in a couple of weeks in another story. And, and I said, I said, but I, I, don't, I don't know that you're going to like my answer. My answer is basically we have some theories, but I can't tell you for sure. <laughs> right? Who were the Nephilim? He, he even said, I even thought maybe I'm a descendant of the Nephilim. <laughs> I was like, you know what? If you want to believe that about yourself, that's up to you. Right? You know, but th there are some things that are still mysterious. There are some things in here where I can, t I can, s I can study my entire life and say, I don't know. <laughs> On this side of heaven, we're, we're not going to know everything. When we get to heaven and we get into the presence of God and God reveals all, we're going to be like, oh. <laughs> we're going to find out we were wrong about some stuff. We were going to find out that we were right about some stuff. We were going to find out that some people we thought were wrong were actually right. <laughs> oh, that's going to hurt, right? Right? But... But, but guys, I want you to fall in love with this book. I want you to, I want you to get to know all the nuances of it and study it. it. It is so deep, you'll never find the bottom of it. I don't, I don't care. If somebody says, oh, okay, I fully understand all of Scripture, I no longer need to study it, I got it. I would say, get away from that person. They're a false prophet. Because the more you study it, the more you don't know, the more you realize you don't know all of God. I love this analogy. What God has revealed to us in his word gives us a little bit of knowledge. Take all the sand off all the beaches in all the world, throw it in one big giant pile. It would be a, it'd be a pile bigger than Mount Everest. Walk up to that pile, lick your thumb, stick it in the sand and pull it back. The pile is God. What's stuck to your thumb is what we understand about God. There's so much more to learn. Fall in love with this book because it's the story of your creator who loves you. Would you bow with me for a word of prayer? Heavenly Father, as we're gathered here this morning, as we're looking into your word for these, for these answers, for these questions, Lord, I, Lord, I pray that, that above all, you would help us to understand that this is your love letter to us. This is your love story. Lord, that you created us out of love. You created us out of a desire for meaningful relationship. Lord, that we fell away. But in your unending, undying, unshakable love, you made a way for us to return to you, even at great cost. Lord, may we, may we fall in love with this story. May we fall in love with what it tells us about you, what it tells us about us. Lord, that we can fully understand and, and, and just come a little bit closer to, to understanding what you did for us and why and what that can mean for us in eternity. Lord, I know that we can look forward to all questions being answered and everything being set straight in the future. But for now, let us fall in love with what you, what you have revealed. Let us trust in your word the miraculous circumstances that it took to get it to us, that, it, that it, it is the most trustworthy historical document in all of mankind. Let us put our faith and trust in it and in you. It's in your name I pray, amen. I want to ask you to stand. We're going to sing a song of invitation. I know this, this sermon hasn't been all evangelistic and that sort of thing, but, but I want you to know if... if if you need to deal with something with God, maybe you need to surrender something. Maybe you need to say, you know what, I surrender to your word. Maybe you, you, whatever that may be, I invite you to come. I'll be down here if you need to talk to me or, or, or get prayer. Maybe you just need to come down to the altar and, and, and talk with God. Whatever you've been called to do to deal with this morning, you do as we sing this song together.
Raise your hand if you've been rescued by the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We're going <laughs> we're gonna to continue with our next song as we, uh, as we uh, accept today's offering. Testament switch a doodle. <laughs> it means it means new creation. He, God did a switch a doodle on me. I once was one way and now I'm another way because of Jesus Christ. The old JC switch a doodle, right? Right. <laughs> I knew I'd get that laugh out of him. I had faith. <laughs>
should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Have we find the Prince so faithful? Who will all our sorrows share? service today. Thank you for being with us and sharing this time with the Lord. God bless you. And now let's go serve him and be Christians. Amen. You are dismissed.